I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. You're listening to the Producer's Perspective Podcast with your host, Tony Award winner, Ken Davenport. Hey everybody, it's Ken Davenport. We're just moments away from this week's podcast with Maury Yeston, who's going to talk about a prescription he has not only for all of us as we develop shows, but for our critics as well, uh, something called positive criticism, very simple, but something I think we should all take to our hearts and to our work. Uh, but before we hear that, this week's podcast is brought to you by a fantastic drinking hole here in Midtown called the New York Beer Company. That name of that company says it all. The New York Beer Company. It's a popular Hell's Kitchen spot near Times Square featuring craft beer, cocktails, brunch, late night, and yes, live music. We've had a bunch of events there. Uh, they also do great events. So I encourage you. They've got a great elevated area. We've had Tony parties there. We've had networking events there. So check it out. The New York Beer Company located at 321 West 44th Street, just a block away from Times Square. Uh, great food, great drinks, great company. The New York Beer Company. Check it out. And now on to this week's podcast. Hello, everybody. Ken Davenport here. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And a special thanks to all of you for the great reviews and comments out there. Please do keep them coming. Uh, and if you have a friend who likes the theater, let them know about what we're doing here. Because the more people talking about theater, the better it is for the theater. Okay, enough of that pitch. Let's get to it. I'm very excited to have on the podcast today. I'm a super fan of this gentleman. Uh, Two-time Tony Award-winning composer and lyricist, Mr. Maury Yeston. Welcome, Maury. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So Maury won the first of his two Tonys for nine, uh, second for Titanic. Uh, He contributed additional music and lyrics to Grand Hotel, including, we were just talking about this, one of my favorite musical theater songs of all time, Love Can't Happen. I'm telling you right now, go get the recording of Grand Hotel. First of all, listen to Brent Barrett sing the crap out of it. It And then there's this bonus track of the late, great David Carroll doing it at the old Steve McGraw's. also, uh, Maury has written a version of Phantom, which is played all over the world, which we're going to talk about that. I was in that. Well, I'm, I'm not surprised. I was, uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised. The Carousel Dinner Theater production of it. Were you the count? Uh, no, I was police officer number Oh my three. God. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and I also covered the Phantom. I think I saw that production. No, you did no, not. The Carousel? Yeah. Where is it? In Akron, Ohio. No, I did not see that. There's <laughs> another carousel. That's right. yeah, There's another carousel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he also taught at Yale. He's on the board of the Songwriters Hall of Fame, was the director of the BMI Workshop for decades. 25 years. We're in the presence of a master of a form, so let's stop wasting uh, everybody's time with this introduction. I want to start with a general question. What is so special about the musical form that so many people around the world just love it? Oh, wow. I think you asked the right person. Uh, you, you know, uh, we like to say that, uh, that that America's great contribution to the world is African American music and jazz, uh, which later became Hispanic, African American music, Mongo Centum, which later became a combination of country, our 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 pop music, so to speak, and, and, and it's true, it, it's true, uh, and, and it comes from uh, our great African American heritage of this country that gave us this kind of syncopated melody that fascinated people like George Gershwin and. Cole Porter and what well, we know that story, but America has given the world another brilliant vernacular that started out in this country and now it has gone all over the world and has become a dominant form, and that's musical theater. And uh, and we've seen it. You and I have really seen it develop in our lifetime. Uh, I, as an example, uh, Nine opened up Broadway in 1982. Uh, the following year, I saw a production of it in Stockholm. Uh, it was really funny because it was, uh, you know, uh, it was Swedish. So that, you know, at the end of nine, I don't know, they'd probably get back together again. In that production, they stood on either side of the of, of, of the stage, and maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't, because it was like depressing in Swedish. Um, but you know that they couldn't do Dreamgirls then because there were v- virtually no black people in, Sw- in Sweden at that time. I, I, I want to advance the clock to uh, oh, I don't know, it's sometime, I guess, probably around nineteen ninety something, and I go to Berlin. Uh, right after uh, the Germans are put back together again, and I'm in a theater called the Theater des Westens, the Theater of the West, and it's it's the only opera house left standing after the war. And uh, and uh, the guys who are running it are, are Helmut and Jörg, and they're a casual couple. 
And uh, which is interesting because when they were up doing lighting cues in the balcony, in the center box, that's where Herr you know, Hitler's sat with Eichmann and all those people. Now here's these two guys <laughs> doing musicals. And, uh, and even by then, uh, a couple of girls came in uh, from the chorus and they were singing in an unusual way uh, in German. And, and then I saw them dance and I, I realized, wait a minute, there's a whole infrastructure that's developing all over the world. Next thing I saw, I saw Titanic uh, later on in, in, in Liege. Uh, and then, of course, uh, nine in, in Japan and in Korea. And, and right now, there are kids all over the world who tap dance. They know all of our shows. They do it in their language. I just got a two CD cast album of nine from Poznan in Polish. So, so that's, that's why, and that's what's going on here. Our form has become internationalized. And, and now, you know, Broadway, which used to be a street, is now a longer street from the West End across Broadway all the way to, to California and to the Ginza on the other side. And, and it's never going to stop. And it's, uh, it's become a, a common language that joins all young people together who are interested in theater or music or both. And it's been a thrill to watch it grow, to be part of it. So I want to talk about your, your beginnings, of course. But before we get there, you got this double CD of nine just yeah. recently? Oh, yeah. That came about, about five months ago. But that was after after I got a CD of the December songs in Polish. And, you know, that was the, those, that's that you, you probably heard Laura Osnes sing. Uh, but, you know, that's been recorded seven times in English. But... Once in Dutch, once in German, once in Polish, uh, and, and that that just blew my mind. Yeah. So what's it, you've obviously had a lot of success in your life, but what's it like to for you now to see your productions done all over the world to get these CDs? Is it still as thrilling now as it was? It, it's 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 even more thrilling. You, you know, I sometimes like to say, you know, the greatest thrill is you're standing on the street corner and some stranger is humming a tune that you wrote. And that 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 has happened. I, I have actually experienced that. Really, but that but but to me, as I now get older and older and older, I realize that um, uh, that that the greatness of our medium. Uh, you know, you start out and you, all you want to do is write something good. Uh, then you want to write something that somebody else likes too. Then you then you want to get it produced. All right, fine. Then it, it, maybe it'll be praised. Maybe it won't. It's better if it's praised. Each one is a sort of a. Uh, another rung up on the ladder, right? Then, uh, then maybe it wins an award, even better. Uh, but you know, you can win an award and close. Okay, then it runs, right? But now, from my perspective, I see from those I admire and some people who I was in, or in classes that I taught twenty and thirty years ago. What thrills me is not that level of success, but what thrills me is to see something that is still viable and still happening even more and more three decades later. That is that is a testament not only to good work done, but also to how extraordinarily our form has developed and, and how beloved it is all over the world. Uh, certainly Disney has helped, but the truth is is that um, long before Disney, there was Andrew Lloyd Webber who wrote a show, and uh, we, know, we know where that is. So how did you find this form? How did it come to you? Uh, uh, I, I started out. I started out playing the piano when I was five. My mother played, and I just started playing, and then she started teaching me. Uh, and then I studied some classical music, and then when I, I won a composition award when I was uh, eight years old, but it was not a very good composition. I was only eight, uh, and, and it was at the local community center. Uh, but then I wanted to play what we called in those days popular music, uh, and and so there was a guy in Bayonne, New Jersey. Uh, I'm going to tell you his name. He has a great... This was his actual name. His actual name was Nat Glatt. And he played club dates. And, you know, by the time I was 13 or 14 years old, I was playing club dates. I just learned how to play that pop music. But but something radical happened to me. Uh, as The first thing was my mother gave me a copy of the Nine Beethoven Symphonies recorded by uh, by uh, a Bruno Walter. Uh, and uh, that, that, you know, I, I, I could sing you those now. That was... That's how profoundly it affected me. But the other thing that happened was they took me to see My Fair Lady when I was very young, out in the original cast, Rex and Julie, and I knew I wanted to do that, uh, in addition to wanting to do everything else. And it simply became a, a goal. I started writing music, 
and uh, and as my life developed, I you know I went to college, I studied classical music, I wrote a cello concerto, I did all kinds of things, but I kept my eye on musical theater as well. And then I went a, I went a, a fellowship to Cambridge University in England for two years, and I joined the Footlights there, and and, uh, and I started writing. Really, the, my first show was a show based on Alice in Wonderland, and. Uh, a producer named David Black had announced in Newsweek magazine that he was going to do a, a version of Alice in Wonderland as a musical on Broadway. And my dad wrote me a letter. I was in England. He said, look, write to this man. Maybe he'll want your music. And I wrote a, a letter, and he wrote me back, and he said uh, he said that he had a group, uh, a team, working on it already, but I sound interesting. Let's meet when next he's in London. And we did. I played him some of my work, and he said, you know what? I think you're talented. When you get back to New York, there's a man called Lehman Engel. And he has the BMI Music Theater Workshop, an audition for him, and you can get in. And, and uh, at that time, I had formulated my strategy. And my strategy was, I'm going to have to find some way to work and make a living while I write musicals, which had become my passion. And I thought, well, if I teach in college, they won't pay me very much, but they'll... Uh, but they'll, give me t they'll pay me time. I'll have summer off. I'll have Christmas vacation. Sometimes you can teach Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which means you have Tuesday and Thursday. And that's what I did. I did a PhD at Yale, all the while going into be in my workshop once a week. And that group, we're talking about the early 70s, that was me and Ed Kleban. And uh, my second year, Alan Menken graduated from uh, NYU, and he came into that shop, Carroll Hall. And we all started working on our things. And Lehman taught us how to do it. And... Um, Ed landed first, I guess, with a chorus line. I think I landed with nine soon after that. Uh, and then in 1982, Lehman died. And we, uh, we thought that the best, the best thing that we could do to preserve his memory, to keep his work, was to take over and keep the class going. And I, took, I, I sat in his chair. And I have to tell you, I really didn't do anything but sit in that chair and, uh, and, and listen to these brilliant people. And... Seeing who was there for the next 25 years is like a roster of who's got Pulitzer Prizes and Tony's all over Broadway. And again, they met there. Certain principles of what makes a good musical are still viable there. And, and I think that's how, that's how it happened. So there's obviously been so much written about the BMI workshop yeah. and the incredible amount of knowledge. And I was a librettist member for a while. Uh, I want you to imagine there's a time capsule. Yeah. Okay. And you're given an index card. And there's only room on this index card for one principle right. from the BMI workshop right. to write down, to put in, to save for future generations. I What's can, the one thing? I can tell you the one thing, and, and it's not so much that the principle is what you get there, okay? The BMI workshop is, the, is, the, is a place where people who write music and lyrics or, and, and, and book are, are able of getting the rarest of commodities in the world, friendly criticism. You get a chance to write something, put it on in front of a group of people and see their reaction. That's everything. Ed Cleveland used to say, anybody more, if, if, never play anything for a single person. But starting with two people or more, that's an audience. And if three people laugh, the audience is going to laugh. And if three people don't laugh, the audience isn't going to laugh. And so writers in the BMI workshop get a chance to write something. It's very fresh. They come in, they play the song. And if it's a hit, so to speak, if people are crying because it's sad or laughing like crazy. I mean, I remember when, oh, oh, okay, when, when Marks and Lopez came in with Avenue Q, for example, and you know, that, and I looked and I looked and I said, Puppets on Broadway. Or who's going to spend $150 Puppets on Broadway? And then they came in with Fine, Fine Line. And it's just a, a world class, you know, pop ballad. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, I don't think they'd mind because uh, they'll remember when they played uh, everyone's a little bit racist for the first time it didn't get the laugh and uh, and they came in with a rewrite the next week and then everybody was on the floor and the reason was something in the way the song it was the same song except they added a little more time in between a couple of things and that gave the audience a chance to realize oh this is not a racist song but, oh this is supposed to I, I have permission to laugh all of those skills the skills of rewriting, and then you can come back and see if your rewrite works. That's what you learn in the BMI workshop, and I think that's the everything of it. Beyond any, I mean, we could talk about wonderful principles that you learn there. Um, self pity never works, uh, things like that. But the truth is, it's the chance to write something 
get it, get feedback on it, and then based on that feedback, rewrite it and make it better. Because that's all, you know, as well as I do, that's all we do. We write something, and then, you know, it's really, really there, and then we come in and we read it, and then it has to be written all over again. Okay, then we get a workshop, and you have to do it all over again. Then it's perfect. Then you put it on stage, and you have to write it all over again, and then you run out of time. <laughs> So tell me how Nine came to be. This is a real passion project of yours, that oh, idea. Yeah. And why did you think that this movie, right? <laughs> really, it's one of the early movie to musical adaptations. In it Fellini's really Eight really is, yeah. Why that? Why did that scream out to well, be a musical? Well, well that, that's one of the things. When you have a, when you have an author uh, initiated piece like that, that one person has a passion for it. Um, when I, I was in high school. Uh, during uh, during that time uh, in in the sixties, when uh, when all of our world was well, for one thing, the the LP had been invented, and all of a sudden you could hear every piece of music, every kind of music that ever was, and we were living classical music, rock music, Elvis, uh, uh, Satyajit Ray films, uh, Fellini movies. I mean, the, you know, the world was foreign films and American films and international music, and and I saw this film eight and a half when I was about sixteen and a half years old. And somehow I identified with it. And I only realized later, the, real, the reason I did was is that this was a guy who was having a midlife crisis in his, in his personality, in his work, in his sexuality, in his personal identity. He was going through his second adolescence. And I saw this film when I was going through my first adolescence. And that's, that's why I identified with it. And I always loved it and adored it. And in the BMI workshop, uh, you know, after the third year, uh, you know, layman suggests, you know, start a project. And I had done a few uh, former projects, and I, I said, you know what, I'm going to keep my pencil sharp. I'll never get the rights to this, but I'll learn how to write by writing. I want, I have a passion for this. I love it. And I started writing nine, and I never thought anything would come of it, uh, except that what Layman Engel used to do, as you remember, he would put on a show twice a year of the best things that have been written in the workshop, did it at the Edison Theater, and we put on three songs from that, and it, was, it caused kind of a sensation. So that was encouraging. But I still never thought anything would happen to it. And then I got lucky, and we were the second show ever to be invited up to the O'Neill. Uh, and when we did it, uh, uh, we got a brilliant guy directing it who had just come to town. His name was Howard Ashman. And Howard directed it. And, uh, and it was, we really, I was really had a chance to work on it. And at the end of that summer, Howard said, you know, I write lyrics. I'm looking for a, a composer. And I said, yeah, you have to meet my friend, Alan Mink. And that's, and that's how that happened. Wow. So you're the matchmaker there. Yeah. Alan talks about that, too. But in any case, still nothing happened. Uh, and then I kept... And you didn't have the rights at this point? No, I didn't have the rights at all. No. You weren't thinking, this is going to win my Tony Awards. No, I never it. thought it would be produced. This was, this was a project, a writing project like anything else. We, you know, layman, and you, we would say, don't worry about rights. You're not, you're not going to get your show on. You're, you're, you're writing because you have to write from where you get your best ideas. Uh, and, and, you know... Uh, and even if it seems like a bad idea to somebody else, you know, uh, uh, Nadia Boulanger, the great teacher of Leonard Bernstein and Eric Copeland and everybody else back in Paris, she had one principle. Actually, Lehman knew her, and Lehman related this to me. And her principle was, never avoid the obvious. What may be non-obvious to everybody else may be very obvious to you. It was just obvious to me somehow that Fellini story had something that cried out to be, to, to be on a stage and, and, and to be sung. And then we won the Richard Rogers Prize. Uh, it was the first one, and uh, when Tommy Toon saw it, he said to me, yeah, I just met him. He said, you know, I think we should go to Broadway, and I have backing, and I think we should do a workshop and do it. And then I, I needed, we needed the rights. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and this is where, this is where whatever happens to you in your life, you never know. I mean, when I was, when I was in college, I kept on bumming all over Europe, and sometimes I get a job playing jazz. And I got a job playing jazz in Florence, in uh, Jazz Americano. Uh, and, uh, and so I got the name of Fellini's lawyer, and, and I called him. Uh, I, was, uh, I was the director of undergraduate studies in music at the time. I was, uh, I, I was, uh, I was uh, probably at the time I was having to, uh, to grade David Loud's uh, senior... <laughs> Senior comprehensive examination before graduate. It was that kind of thing, and I called the man up at six o'clock in the morning, and uh, I said, to, you know, his name was uh, Sotero Salas. I said, Mr. Salas, I'm Mr. Maury Yeston, and uh, I, uh, I'm an American composer, and I've written a musical based on Fellini's masterpiece, Movie Eight and a Half, and I'd like to come to Rome to buy the dramatic rights from you. 
And he said to me, uh, he said to me, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Aston, but I, I don't speak English. Uh, and so I, I said the same thing in Italian. You speak Italian. <laughs> well, I, uh, God spoke to me. I said, Non fa niente, mi chiamo Mori Aston, sono un compositore americano. Io ho scritto un spettacolo musicale basato su questo capolavoro film di Fellini, otto e mezza, e voglio andare la settimana prossima in Italia per comprare i riti drammatici. They gave you the right to write that. No, he fine. didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, Signor Yeston, but uh, we can only work with a well-known Broadway producer. And I, uh, I said, well, uh, wouldn't you agree with me that Herman Levin is a well-known Broadway producer. He says, Herman Levin, you know, produced My Fair Lady, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, uh, The Great White Hope. And Herman at the time had an option on one of my shows. And he was a very close friend of my family's. He used to come to our Passover Seders. So I said, okay, so I'll be in, I'll be in Rome next week uh, to buy, to, to negotiate for the dramatic rights uh, f- uh, for eight and a half, representing me and my partner, Herman Levin. And you had not told Herman about it. I this called this Herman morning. right away. I said, Herman, can I go to Italy and say, you're my partner, so I can get the rights to eight and a half? He said, sure, kid. He said, swing around the office and sign a release, a release first. And you know what? Uh, it's it, it's miraculous, but, you know, it's a longer story, but that that's kind of what happened. Well, really not miraculous, in my opinion. It's you, passionate about this project passionate. and willing to do anything yeah. it takes in the confidence. Yeah. Anybody who's listening to this story, just go for it. You know, freedoms. I, I had nothing left to lose. What I love, yeah, you just kept doing it yes. and trying it. And regardless. worse would happen is so it wouldn't have gotten on. I'm but sure I people were like, ah, you're never going to get it. It's not going to happen. Of course. Try something else. Uh, that's, well, no, it's not try something else. You, you know what? I, I tell everybody, Scott Joplin, who invented ragtime, you know, and he thought it was classical music, and it was. He, he wrote at the beginning of it, you know, these piano pieces ought to be played slowly, you know. And he wrote an opera called uh, Three Manisha, a uh, Three Manisha. And, uh, and he spent so much of time, the rest of his life, trying to get it produced. And I like to tell everybody, you know, he should have written three minutia, four minutia, five minutia. You know, write the next thing, and then you never know. And, or you know what? You wrote something, and it made you a better writer. Not everybody and everything gets produced. And don't spend the whole rest of your life trying to get some masterpiece produced. Maybe you'll do something much great, and then you'll have such credibility, everybody will want to see that thing you, you wrote earlier. I want to talk about your other. I want to go through almost show by sure. show here because there's a similarity in each one. Sure. So Titanic. Let's just skip ahead to Titanic. Sure. Sure. Did people tell you, "Are you crazy to write a musical about Titanic?" This sure. Show? And sure. Well, well, who would write a musical based on the, the worst maritime disaster in history? And so, why did you? What was it about that they were like, "Oh, I have to do this"? A couple of things. Uh, my dad was born in England. Uh, we're British Yiddish, and then they came to Montreal, and and my English family was there, and. So I spent a lot of time there, and when I was at Cambridge, I spent two years there. And I, I learned something about class uh, class structure uh, in England that I really didn't understand in America, because there's a lot of it that's still there. I mean, um, um, my very first day in my rooms at Clare College, uh, and I had there were four rooms in, in an entryway, and I think they told me the room I was in was the one that Watson was in when he was working with Crick. And... Uh, and and each in those days there were at Oxford and Cambridge there were there were you, there were two servants to every entryway a jip and a better the jip was somebody who would do washing up and things like that and the better were generally they were World War One pensioners who would make the bed and sweep the floor I mean these were the the, the elevated upper class intellectual upper class Brits and on day one my jip guy by the name of George he was a great guy knocked on my door and said oh, Mr Yes and he said if you want if you want your shoes done I'll you just leave them outside your door, and I'll shine them. And I said, well, George, we, we fought a revolution over this. I'm, I'm happy to shine my own shoes, and don't worry about it. And he said to me, well, now, if everybody felt that way, Mr. Yes, then I'd be out of a job now, wouldn't I? And, and that's, that I carried that with me and began to understand his pride, his pride at serving at, at, his, at his place, and, you know, Downton Abbey now makes Titanic very understandable because we all now see what the rigidity of that class structure is. But the rigidity of that class structure worldwide in the Edwardian age is why 1,100 poor third-class people were locked below and died, while all the first-class women, except for one, were in a lifeboat. And that one elected to stay with her husband. This is Strauss. So... 
So I'd always thought that that, that Titanic was a, a, had a very great lesson and and, and carried a very great uh, a very great story. Um, and uh, and around about 1985, uh, uh, when uh, the ship was found by Ballard on the bottom of the ocean, I, I said to myself, you know, the 20th century is coming to a close. And, uh, you know, it kind of started around 1910, 1913, you know, the right of spring and eight tonal music and God knows what. And it's kind of coming to an end. And if there's one story that could encapsulate the lesson of the 20th century, it's probably the Titanic. Uh, because uh, the things that most enhance the world also have most destroyed it. Technology uh, that could save people's lives or kill more people in one minute than, than we ever could before. And in the case of the Titanic, it was an unreasonable uh, faith in the infallibility of technology. And I thought, gee, that might be an interesting piece to write. And three months later, after I started thinking that way, the space shuttle blew up because there was an O-ring. And I realized that's a story. And as I began to dig into it, I, I came to understand that I asked the question, who would I be if I was on the Titanic? And I realized, well, you know, I'm the guy who writes it. I'd be the architect. And if I was the architect, I'd be building a ship that would be its own lifeboat. I would be building a ship that would save lives as never before. That would be my dream. I'm Jonas Salt trying to do a vaccine that is going to prevent people getting polio. You know, maybe the early trials will kill people. I don't know, but it's the dream. It's the intention. And the intention was to do good. And you know what? I often think if that ship hadn't hit an iceberg, it, it probably would have built 30 more like it right away. And so, but, and I realized everything on that ship was a dream. It was this, it was, there's something so positive in, in what's going on in that ship. It's the dream of these, the, the reason they had built a big ship in the first place was to compete with the German ships that were building hordes of immigrants to our country. And, you know, do that do that show now, and it's about exactly what's going on right now, isn't it? Um, and and the second class had just been created by the Industrial Revolution. You know, they could, like, rub elbows with the rich and famous. And, of course, the first class around the world, and their dream was that their hegemony would last forever. And so I thought, gee, that's, that's a really very positive and thing to write about. And, unfortunately, when that ship went down, that whole world went down. The Edwardian world went down. With it. And, you know, and the world in which George said to me, that's all right, I'm proud, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm proud to serve the upper class. I'd be, as opposed to what, you know, what does he give up by doing that? And so I thought, that's really something interesting. And I became passionate about it. And I started to write it. And then I got a call from uh, Mr. Toon in late 1989. And he said, uh, Yeston, uh, I'm an Boston with Grand Hotel. I had a room for you with a piano at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Come save the show. And I ran up there with Peter Stone. And uh, after we, uh, I don't know how we pulled it off. We pulled it off. It was three, believe it or not, everything I wrote for that show was three weeks. Uh, and uh, when we, we invited Mike Nichols to come see it about, about a week before we opened. And Nichols saw the show and we were breathlessly standing there and, and we said, what do you think? And he said, he said, I can't believe you won't get away with it. <laughs> so, and then Peter said, well, what are you doing next? And I said, oh, I'm writing Titanic. I've been writing it for a few years. And he said, well, that's my show. I said, no, it's not Peter. It's my show. He said, yeah, but I want to write it with you. I said, okay. And so we decided we would write it. That show, if I remember correctly, had a, because it was incredibly technical, that piece, right? Worst, sank a ship. worst preview in the history of Broadway. Right. The so that's what I was going to say. It was a challenging preview I, period. I, have, I remain resentful of Spider-Man that kind of broke my record. Um, uh, and we knew we knew how bad we knew how bad it went. First of all, we had all the things that happen when you when when you have just normal trouble anyway with the show. Not to mention the ship, ship can't sink. And Michael Riedel is writing articles like, "Wow, watch him sing, watch him dance, watch him drown," um, which he wrote. That was that was he's apologized because it's his favorite show now. Um, but here's something that, that Peter Stone says. I, you know, I live by aphorisms that people I've worked with, like Stone or Larry Gelbart, say along the line. Peter used to say, and he's quite right, you want to be in trouble out of town. You want to lower expectations. Because, because you know, I hear they're having trouble. Well, all right, fine. So now you've come into town, you've worked on the show, and people say, you know what, here it's getting better. They're working on it. And then, 
by the end of it, look at the story in Grand Hotel. And by the end of it, miracle of, well, my one and only was huge trouble. We went, we, we worked it, right? And, and it came in, and I think the lead was miracle on 43rd Street. And so, as opposed to, as opposed to, the word out of town is, it's a masterpiece. It's the greatest thing so-and-so has ever done. And so, you know, New, tough New Yorkers are sitting here with their arms folded, full of going, all right, show me. And so lowering expectations is not the worst thing in the world. And and um, what's interesting is with the initial reviews of Titanic reflected that local uh, that the local uh, um, story going around the uh, town because the local critics gave it some gave it very positive reviews but mixed to positive reviews. The out of town critics who weren't reading every day about what's going on in the street and they're having such trouble and they can't, they didn't know about that as well as the people who were writing locally and they gave it high praise right away. I'll never forget Michael David's speech at the Tony Awards that year when you won for best music. You won everything. And Michael said this is a message for all the theatrical handicappers out there. Right. That Basically said, oh, Titanic never has a chance before giving it a chance. That's right. And, and Peter's, Peter's, Peter's thanked the critics. He said, what would we do without them? <laughs> and well, that, that was extraordinary. So another, I just love your, your, your never give up attitude here. And another example of that, of course, is Phantom, which has been done thousand plus times around the world. Well, even, more even, now. even more than that now. I mean, I just literally came back from Japan where I saw two productions. One of them, uh, one of them in in Tokyo, uh, and, uh, and that's the fourth time that company has produced it. And one of them in Osaka with the Takarasuka organization. But you, you don't have enough time to talk about that. It's a troupe of eighty women in Osaka who do musicals, and women play the men's roles. And uh, this is the fourth time they, they've done that. And and as I was as I was coming out of an elevator, I, I, I ran into Bobby Johansson who was in Tokyo to do some sort of business, but he had just come in from Seoul, Korea, because he was mounting uh, Phantom for the second time in Seoul. Right, when he, because they in did Seoul. it at Paper Mill, yeah. one of the big re- premiere yeah. productions. It, of, know, it's probably my, my most performed show. And you know, that story is simply, that that's not so much a question of sticking to it as just move on. You know, um, Jeffrey Holder called me and Arthur Copet soon after Nine became a big hit. And, uh, and he said in his basso profundo, he said, I've, I've got this book, you know, uh, uh, by Gaston de Roux, and I think it's a great sh- I read the book. So we read the book, and, and we came to talk to him. And I said, uh, Jeffrey, I think it's a really bad idea. I mean, it's a horror, it's a, it's a horror movie. The five movies were done. I said, you know, what are we going to do next? Mothra meets Godzilla, the musical? And he said, no, 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 I think there's, I think there's something there. Let, you know, think about it. Let's, let's meet again. By the next time we met... I said, uh, you know, I've been thinking about it. Um, the central character is is a kind of a, even though he's purportedly a monster, uh, he's 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 born misshapen at, at birth. And you know, back there in the nineteenth century, if you had a mad sister, you'd lock her in the attic. So you know, we'd put him down below the opera on this lagoon and not let anybody see him. But as 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 ugly as he may seem on the outside, he's been raised with the beauty of music wafting down the great sopranos and the greatest music masterpieces in the world. And he's lived with nothing but musical beauty that's inhabited his soul. And he's as beautiful on the inside as he is horrible on the outside. And he's kind of a Quasimodo character. And he reminded me of, um, of the, of El- the elephant man in, in the same way. And so there's a, there's a sort of very compassionate story there. And, and, uh, if there's a universal principle, maybe it's, you know, who among us really doesn't feel, despite my outfit, outward imperfections, I mean, I mean, well, inside. And so it was inspiring to me. And Arthur and I got down and we made it. We made this story. and We invented his mother. We, we, we invented that story and we started writing it. And, and um, Jeffrey loved it. And there were three producers there. And I remember we were flown out to San Antonio and they had raised all the money. And there were drawings of the set. And... Uh, you know, it was the mid '80s, and uh, there was, and then, unlucky or not, uh, the, the the Gaston Leroux novel had gone into the public domain. Anybody could do it. You didn't need the rights to it. And Andrew Lloyd Webber had seen the Ken Hill Phantom, and he had this great idea. And there was a story in the paper that Andrew Lloyd Webber is going to write Phantom of the Opera, and 
of course, having had that kind of fabulous and well-deserved fame uh, and, and cachet, the idea that he would do that, it would very likely be a hit in London, and that being the case, very often a hit in London can transfer, and and all of the supporters of our show, including all of us, felt, you know what, this this is now not a good idea anymore, you know, uh, and good luck to Andrew, and uh, ju- I just moved on. You know, uh, Alan Carr called me up and said, Placido Domingo wants you to write him a musical based on the life of Francisco Goya. And I said, all right, fine, you know, I've got some French songs. Maybe it'll work for that show. You know, look, you just move on. And uh, and that was it. And Andrew had his wonderful, well-deserved success. And and Arthur and I did what you do in cases like that. Uh, he took the story, even though we both write, every, you know, we both help each other with everything. I said, look, you take the book. I'll take the songs. Uh, maybe a couple of trunk songs I'll use in something else. And Arthur, because of the the excitement about Andrew's show and its success, Arthur sold uh, our story uh, to, uh, and it became a uh, it became a miniseries, an NBC miniseries, char- uh, uh, starring I remember that. starring Charles Dance. That's our story, and uh, it was very successful and much beloved. And I guess in late nineteen early nineteen ninety, uh, a man named Frank Young uh, from a theater in in in, uh, in Houston. Uh, came to see us. There was a, well, there was a, a, a there was a critic named Matthew Gervich wrote an article about uh, my score, calling the the, uh, the masterpiece that will never be heard, or something like that. Um, and uh, Frank came up and said, "I saw the master. I, I saw the I saw the uh, miniseries. It was really extraordinary, and, and I, I'm dying to hear the music." So we played him music, and he said, I, "I really want to produce this. I think we could produce it in the theater under the stars." Uh, and I said, absolutely not. I, I don't want to be perceived as chasing Andrew down the street. I have my own shows I'm going to do. And he said, no, no, no. I, and I said, and, and who's going to who's going to know what's what? And he said, I guarantee you, we will spend a million dollars on the production. But besides that, every phone call that we answer, every ad that we put out, we will say in no uncertain terms, this is not the Andrew Lampard of the Fan of the Opera. This is a new American production. And and so I said, why not? I'd love to see it. And uh, that production, that opening night was 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 crazy because granite-hearted cowboys were weeping into their bandanas uh, that moment when you know he says you're my son uh, and uh, we did it in Seattle and made it better and since that time it just it's had a life of its own but everywhere yeah it's a beautiful everywhere. production it's, it's so been, different it's, from Andrew it's great in, in Finnish. And I think we just booked Brno in Czech Republic. It's one of those great reminders of how stories can have such a different perspective based on the artists that put them together. And, the, and you know what? They're completely independent shows, yeah. and they're two different takes on the same story. And how is that any different than how many ballets based on Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty? It's, it's what it is. Or uh, painting or Beauty and the Beast. Fruit. I mean, it's that's that it. same thing. Th- that's it. And and so the world has both of them, and we're, and we're richer for it. Uh, it's great in French. I, I saw it in Liège in French. Uh, what do you think about critics these days? And has that opinion changed over time? How do you feel they've changed? <laughs> well, you know, some of the best critics were writers. Uh, T.S. Eliot was a wonderful critic. Uh, Debussy was a music critic. Schumann was a music critic. Um, They're in the fifties and the sixties. As I'm growing up, I would I would read them. People like Walter Kerr, things like that. Uh, I think they're very astute people. Uh, the best kind of critic is, for me, uh, one that says what he or she thinks about it, and and often uh, makes almost suggestions as to what something lacks or or what it needed more of. Um, they're not interested in. In, in cute, nasty things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out on the man, uh, the wonderful man who uh, wrote music criticism, for, uh, music theater criticism for Time magazine many years ago. We lost him. Do you remember who he was? I don't. Anyway, uh, Peter once, and, and he's a wonderful, wonderful critic. And Peter, Peter Stone asked him once, you write so well and, and you're so positive often. Well, why is that? And he said, you know what? Some people write best when they're being bitchy. 
and I just seem to write my best when I'm when I'm writing something positive about something, and so that's where I, that's the direction I I, I go in. So uh, so I, I think I think for the most part, um, critics eat, and I, I think critics now uh, on the whole are literate. I think uh, they try to be as honest as they can about about the experience that they had. Uh, every once in a while, just like I can, you know, I can write a song that's not perhaps up to my best standards, and every once in a while, a critic might write a piece that's really not up to his or her best standards in terms of um, the tone or the tenor of what the what the criticism is. Uh, and uh, but I think for the most part, I, I uh, you know, I I value that. I think that you know they're they're part of the conversation. They're they're part of of the, of the community that we are. Uh, and, and and without us, they'd have nothing to talk about. They wouldn't have a job. I mean, you know, I, I, there are lots of wonderful stories. I, there's a whole book of things that artists have to say about critics, of course. But you know, as an artist, sometimes we're very resentful, get very upset. I mean, the famous Beethoven letter to the critic. Which is, you know, dear sir, I'm in the smallest room in my house. I have your review before me. Soon it will be behind me. <laughs> and with all the musicals you've seen, read, yeah. heard in the BMI workshop, what's the most common, I hate to use the word mistake, but what's the most common flaw you see that writers make? Well, uh, there, there are, Let's, in two categories. The first has to do with the material. The second has to do with um, with uh, attitude, their own personal attitude. Um, the the biggest mistake that writers make is to fall in love with their work prematurely, uh, and then to keep on trying and believing in it and being unwilling. To step back and say, you know what? Why don't I just try to write a better song? I still have the song I wrote, right? Uh, just trying to will your. So I think that's. That, but I think the most important principle is the very first thing that Layman Angle said to me and our class on that very first day, and I lived by it. And he quoted E. E. Cummings, a wonderful poem: "Since feeling is first, who pays attention to the syntax of things?" Will never wholly kiss you. Got to feel something. That's the most important thing. You know, my I had a wonderful uh, uh, agent, Flora Robertson. You would go to see, it and, she, and and you would say, you know, I just saw. So, and she'd say, did you feel anything? Because if you can make people feel something, make them laugh, make them sad, make them make them angry. Um, I think that's everything, and I think that's the most important thing. And the first thing, you have to feel it. And then it's very helpful, as I say, in a workshop or in trials or so, to find out are you? how do I write so that what I'm feeling, I can make other people feel. And sometimes you have to learn that it's not so obvious how to do that. I'm sure you were in a book, so you know one of the principles is sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to not uh, not say literally what you want them to feel, but sometimes you have to actually go to the opposite. You know, uh, we like to say one of the things. Well, Alan Lerner in his in his autobiography, uh, the street uh, the street that the street where I live, he wrote what moved him most is unrequited yearning. And Lehman used to say what moved him most is you're watching Romeo and Juliet. And she's on the balcony, and he's climbing the trellis, and she's reaching down, and he's reaching up, and and they're reach, but they can't get their hands can't touch; they're an inch apart, and they're straining and straining, and we're sitting there in the audience, and we are straining for them, and so as Layman used to say, because because we they can't accomplish it, that emotion gets thrown in our laps, and we want it. For them, and so that's why it's what's not happening. It's that the love isn't consummated. That we are so moved by that we want it to happen, and that's why your favorite song 
was presented to me in a show that was on stage, and David Carroll was had just broken into a ballerina who was 25 years older than he's supposed to be. And she was, and he was. Young, handsome guy, and she's Lillian Montevecchi. And uh, he's stealing her pearls. And she says to him, what are you doing in my room? And Wright and Forrest had written, uh, or Luther Davis had written, I'm here to breathe the air that you breathe. And I, I admire you. And then he sang a song about... Um, now, uh, and the lyric was, now with you standing there, it was a perfectly good song. It was somehow a love song. Um, and it wasn't working. And it wasn't showing David for what David could do. And I knew he had an A flat and, I, and, and all of that. And so the first thing I said to Peter, and, and, and we were fixing, you know, and I said to Peter, Look, the first thing we have to do is deal with that line. What are you doing in my room? And here to breathe the air that you breathe. And I said, hey, what? look, why don't we just keep the line? And why don't we just have peace? I'm here to breathe the air of your breeze. And have her pick up the phone to the desk, front desk and say, you have 30 seconds to come up with a better line, or I'm calling the match. And we put, I'm and, sure yeah. that your, your previous book writer loved that. <laughs> well, well, Luther, he, you know what? Uh, they were very reasonable. Uh, you know. He saved the show. Well, yeah, but, you know, well, look, I, I can't talk about Luther, but I can't talk about writing for us. The first thing I did, I saw the show, and then I had lunch with him. And I said, gentlemen, I mean, I'm so overwhelmed. To be, they were both in their 80s. I said, my God, you know, stranger in paradise. <laughs> the things that you've written, I'm in awe. And one of them said to the other one, oh, look how young he is. Doesn't he remind you of us when we first met Cole Porter? And I went, oh, my God, oh, buddy. I can go home now. <laughs> and, um, and you know, I said, look, you know, uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and... He, and um, I'm not here to write it, uh, just to give you advice. And they said, no, no, there's a lot of work to be done. And you, you, you jump in the boat. And, uh, they, they insisted that I be they insisted that I be credited for it. And I said, no, I'm not supposed to. Nobody's supposed to know I'm here. And they said, no, we insist. And I found out later that when they were very young, they were given a job like that, and the author wouldn't give them any credit. And they, they made a vow that if that ever happened to them, they would give the person credit. So, okay, so back to... I, I breathe the air with you. Breathe. You have you have thirty seconds to with a better line. And then I realized that this is an impossible situation. It's a twenty five year old David Carroll, and she's fifty something year old Lillian Montevecchi uh, uh, on the other end, and they're supposed to fall in love immediately and 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 be together for the rest of the play. And that's just impossible. That can't happen. And so I write a song about it. But of course, the miracle is, as they're saying, this can't happen. This can't happen. Just like the two hands trying to reach together, it does. And that's the miracle of musical theater. It's brilliant contrast. And with that, let me take it to the last question, which okay. is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and thanks you for your incredible contributions to the American musical theater and also for helping so many writers achieve better musicals through all the education that you've given them. Grant you one wish. What's the one thing that drives you nuts about Broadway? It gets you angry. You're you're like that time critic, actually. You're so positive, even with your criticism. It's like BMI. It's no no wonder uh, you learned at the at the altar of, of Layman. Uh, what's the one thing that you'd ask this genie to wish away or change about Broadway if you had a chance? That's a very good question. You have to give me a minute. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um. Well, let, let, let me let me process the answer by going through things. Certainly, you know, I I'm not going to talk about business, right? Uh, and I'm I'm certainly not going to talk about uh, creative control, because we do have that in, in the theater. I mean, I can tell you there's fun stories about. I mean, there's a great story about you know I don't I don't know if it was Jerry Herman didn't want to cut a song up in up in, in New Haven, and uh, that night when when the song just wasn't in the show, despite the fact that he refused to cut it, because David Merrick had come, gone into the stands and removed the parts from the orchestra's desks. <laughs> so they, they turned the page, there was nothing to play. Uh, I, 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 I'm not going to talk about that. The, the one thing uh, that I would, I would wish away uh, would be would be the the, the pressure uh, that's put upon the writers uh, not understanding that what writers need, particularly young writers, more than anything else, is uh, support. Uh, that's everything. Uh, after a whole lifetime of teaching 
incredibly gifted people, music theory and music and how to write and how to do lyrics, I've learned something, which is that truly gifted people, uh, truly gifted people are able to learn that the art of writing is the art of rewriting, and they're capable of doing that. And I think the most important thing is the work itself. It's what's on the stage that's going to get people in, that's going to sell the tickets in the final analysis. And I think that if writers could be supported and trusted by everybody, by the agents, by the by the by the directors, by um, uh, by, by the producers, I remember you know, I, I remember one producer standing next to me. David Carroll was singing his second song in in in, in, in rehearsal, uh, a song called "Roses at the Station." And he pointed to the stage and he said, that song will not be on stage opening night. And I said, you know what? There's only one person uh, involved in a musical who's in charge of delivering a successful evening of theater, and that's the director. Speak to the director, the director will speak to me. And I, I think that, you know, just in terms of protection, you know, I, I can tell you, uh, I won't tell you, but a very brilliant, gifted uh, pair of writers, uh, one of whom has numerous uh, now Oscars and Tonys and Emmys uh, had a show on Broadway and uh, in preview uh, their producers very well known producers and you would recognize their names instantly cut uh, cut the uh, their opening number of the second act they called I, I got a call that was in tears they said we went to our show tonight to a preview and the opening of the second act wasn't there the producer cut it took it out of the show and I said that's why we have the drama the skills and, and I guess Mr. Sondheim or Mr. Stone or somebody called the producer up and said, you know what, you can't do that. But that, that's what I think. Nurturing, nurturing the talent, because that's, that's, that's the only thing, that's where this all comes from. They're the geese that lay the golden eggs. And I think so. Uh, understanding, support, sometimes you have to be tough with them, but, but treating them with with uh, love, kindness, and understanding that they are the ones who are delivering this piece to you. And uh, uh, that would be, uh, that's what I wish for. Very well put. Thank you so much for that, for being with us today, uh, and for your incredible contributions. I, I'm not a genie, but I will thank you for them. <laughs> thank uh, you, and genie. for all of you out there, we're going to post that link to Love Can't Happen and David Carroll because it's, uh, okay. it's one of my favorite songs and it's just great to, to hear it and also to, to listen to David singing If Only You Were Around Today. Uh, thank you so much and oh. we will see you next time.